if you have your Bibles, why don't you open to Genesis chapter 33 is where we'll be this morning. We're going to start anyway. We're going to cover both Genesis 33 and a little bit of Genesis 35 this morning, um, but we're going to kind of finish our story. Uh, so as you're turning there, someone asked me this week, what was, um, it was kind of an interesting question. What is the worst part of ministry for you? And I was like, man, that's a really good question. Let me count the ways. Do you have a few minutes to spare here? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, you know, and so I was like, I, I don't know. I was like, you know, let me think about this again. But then I realized I did actually answer that question once in a sermon a couple years ago, and uh, maybe even less than that. And I said it was bearing other people's pain. I think that's one of the hardest parts of ministry, uh, walking with you through pain. Uh, life is super painful. And when you see people going through difficult times, it is a burden that I share with many of you. And when I hear things going on in your life and it's painful, I, um, I feel that. And you bring it home with you. And, and uh, ministry is not something you take lightly. And so you go home and you carry that with you. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been a Christian for years. Your friends have shared pain with you. And you've, burdened, you've carried that burden as well. And that's probably one of the hardest parts of ministry. But a close second is actually related but different. It's when people make really bad choices and are dealing with the ramifications of those bad choices. And they come and talk to me about those bad choices. Um, I mean, I kind of laugh at it now. But I've talked to people who have had affairs. I've talked to people who have had immediate relationships and their families completely broken, um, broken over money in particular of what I'm thinking of right now, um, completely tore apart the immediate family. I've talked to people who got so lost in their addictions to alcohol or drugs, they didn't do anything. They, or excuse me, they would do anything they could to get those substances. And you feel the weight of this as well, not only just the pain of life that is not always our fault, but also the choices we make that leads us to pain in our lives as well. So as our lead team was kind of talking about this the other day, I made some comment um, that if anyone has actually read Genesis 6, 5, where it says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. <laughs> and I said this verse and I was like, oh man, that is painful. And one of our lead team members who shall remain nameless said, that is my favorite verse in the Bible. <laughs> and I was like, that is really pessimistic. And I totally get it. I absolutely understand what you're saying. Not only from a perspective of ministry, but empirically. I know my own heart too. And uh, I know how evil my choices can be sometimes. And you read those things, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, only evil continually. And you just go, this is painful. And life is painful. We make it painful and we experience pain as well. Quite frankly, the reason I share that is I think it describes a lot of the people in Genesis uh, and a lot of the patriarchs in Genesis in particular. And I'm not just considering the ones we'd consider evil, the ones who are markedly evil in the text, but ones who we might consider um, quote unquote heroes of the faith. I say this because the life of Jacob in Genesis 25 through 35 has struck me as a complete mess. Um, the more I've read this story, I didn't realize it until this sermon series. I've read Genesis, I, I don't know, so many times in my life. I mean, it's a book that you just continue to go back to. I enjoy Genesis a lot, but it was in this reading of it and this time in this sermon series, when I looked at Genesis, Je, uh, Jacob's life and I was like, I'm noting some really sad things that he has gone through, basically because of his own decisions or even indecisions. And it's super painful to see those things. So I'm thankful how he makes a bit of progress towards the end of his story, uh, but a constant drum beat that pounds through his life is that God is faithful. Boom, boom. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful for no other reason than the fact that God wants to be faithful to Jacob. And that is what we see. And it's great hope for me in that and great hope for you as well, that God is faithful to us regardless of what you've done, uh, regardless of how good you are, how righteous you are, what choices God chooses to be faithful to his people for some random reason. It's great love. It's amazing. It's a mystery. And for us to see that is so encouraging. I see it all over the life of Jacob. Honestly, friends, I don't even find Jacob likable. <laughs> Looking at this thing, I, I, I know I'm supposed to recognize that he plays a part in God's plan and how he wrestled with God in such a beautiful way, teaches about prayer. All that is true, and there are certain things we can catch from his life. But I read Kent Hughes this week, who's a pastor and commentator. He mentioned this. He goes, Jacob is morally weak, unwilling to pay the cost of his right actions, untrusting of God, unmindful of the welfare of his children, the future of his people. I'm like, wow, how do you really feel, Kent? You know, that's, that's pretty much landed on the line there. The cost of his actions and consequences of them show up in the middle of the two chapters we're looking at this week. And we're not
not going to look at that. And if you've read it before, you know exactly what I mean. It is super painful and not just painful. It's absolutely disgraceful. And it's somewhat awkward to even read in chapter 34. And we won't get there, but we're going to read in chapters 33 and 35 because sandwiched in the middle of this is this great pain and sin and brokenness. But on both sides, God's faithfulness abounds to Jacob because he wants to be faithful. It reminds me that we're finishing up this story today um, of Jacob, and it reminds me of a quote from a famous British missionary to China in the late 1800s, whose name was Hudson Taylor, who founded the China Inland Mission and now Overseas Missionary Fellowship. He says this, All God's giants have been weak men and women who have gotten hold of God's faithfulness. Man, I... I read that this week uh, just randomly. I was like, that totally fits with my sermon. I got to use that. Uh, All of God's giants, maybe I'll put those in quotes, if you will, have been weak men and women who have gotten hold of God's faithfulness. He went on to say somewhere else as I followed this trail a little bit, that God is not looking for men of great faith. He is looking for common men to trust in his great faithfulness something beautiful about that. And as I think of the life of Jacob, and as I hear the stories of of brokenness and pain and choices that we make, let me remind you of this. Our job, our hope is to hold fast to God's faithfulness. And not just that, but to get hold of it, as Hudson Taylor says. And that's my hope today. My hope in my sermon today is to help you get hold of God's faithfulness in your life. It's good news for you and for me as well. Last week, we started what I was hoping to be the conclusion of Jacob's feud with his brother Esau. And we didn't quite get there. And we talked about gospel prayer last week. So in some ways, we're going to finish off last week's sermon and start again with another sermon. But you'd be surprised how well they connect uh, in chapter 33 and 35. But what I'm calling today in this initial part of this is gospel reconciliation. So we had gospel prayer last week and we had gospel reconciliation this week. And this is the anticipated resolution to the huge conflict in Genesis, the relationship between Esau and Jacob. And I set it up over the last few weeks that Jacob and Esau had a major falling out after Jacob, who was the younger, stole the, uh, the sort of stole the birthright of his brother Esau, who was the older, who actually kind of st- sold it to him. But that's another story as well. But then he took the blessing from his father too. So Esau vowed to kill them. And these two brothers didn't see each other for 20 plus years. And so we catch up today in their story of finally when they actually reconnect face to face. When Jacob decides to go home. He knew that he would run into Esau. And so he did all these things to appease his brother. He sent gifts. He broke up his big, large group of people into parties. So if Esau was angry, he wouldn't kill all the people at once. I mean, it's just, he's setting up this moment to meet Esau and connect with him for the first time. And that's what we have in Genesis 33. I'm going to read it to you this morning and uh, get the, the final analysis of what happens. Would you follow along with me in your text? It says this, So Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. It's kind of foreshadowing, almost scary, those words, 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Man, if you're, this is the first time you're reading this story. Like if you if pretend you've never read Genesis before, you have this moment of pure relief. Like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? You were waiting to see what was going to happen. The author set it up in such a way that you knew there was going to be a battle. Even the 400 men seemed scary and daunting. But Esau comes running after his brother, kisses him, and they weep together. This reconciliation that is unfounded. You're just like, what is going on? And it says, then Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children. And he said, who are these with you? So Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near and they bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, no, please. If you have found favor, if I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God. And you have accepted me 
Please accept my blessings that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. Thus he urged him and he took it. Then Esau said, let us journey on our way and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of my servant and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned the day, that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan on the way from Paran Aram. And he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. Then he erected an altar and he called it El Elohe Israel. It's almost a relief. Such a good ending here. Although Jacob's method of meeting up with his brother is a little bit sketchy. And the same spontaneous Esau who gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup is now overjoyed at the reunion with his brother. This is a very cool moment in scripture. One we have been waiting for. Even Jacob's words ring out here where he says in Genesis thirty-three eleven, Please accept my blessing that is brought to you. A reminder, if you will, of the sordid past and what happened with the blessing of things going on here, right? Jacob's reminding, I'm giving back to you, in a sense, what I once stole from you. Friends, this picture, I think, is one of our deepest longings of people that we see in Jacob and Esau that we desire in our own lives. We all have broken relationships and we all long for healed relationships, reconciled relationships and restored relationships with other people who are near to us, who are in our family, that we are broken in our relationship. And we see an amazing picture here of what can happen when people come together again. I really want to point out one big thing about this story in Genesis chapter 33, and that's that we are reminded here that God sometimes displays the hope of the gospel in the lives of broken people. And that's what we see in Jacob and Esau. There are pictures of the gospel in different human act interactions that are beautiful. I think one of them is adoption. We have this picture of salvation when we see adoption happen in families. And I take great joy when I hear of imprint families adopting children or fostering kids. And I find such joy in that because it's a great picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think of caring for a person who cannot care for themselves. That is a picture of the gospel as well. And this here is one of those pictures as well, where these two brothers who are enemies with each other reconcile together and it becomes one of the most amazing pictures that we have of the idea of grace. In Genesis 33, 4, Esau ran to meet his brother Jacob and he braced him, fell on his neck and he kissed him and then they wept. Everything is fixed in a sense. Do you know that Esau in the storyline of Genesis is clearly the better character? <laughs> clearly. You just see it over and over again. And funny enough, his descendants become enemies of Israel in the future, which is really unique and hard to reconcile. Yet God chose Jacob, even though Esau is the stronger one and the one who displays one of the biggest pictures of grace in the stories of reconciliation we find in the Bible. What's interesting is he shows up a few more times throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Even the prophet Malachi brings this whole thing up. And Paul will quote later in Romans chapter 9 about this relationship between Jacob and Esau. And I just told you, Esau is the better character and Jacob's kind of a loser. But this is what Malachi 1, 1 through 3 says. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Now, I don't have enough time till eternity to explain what this verse even means. Nor do I have time this morning. But what I find so interesting about this is the constant faithfulness, that pounding of a drum of faithfulness in God's life in God's care for Jacob. Yet Esau is the one who seems to do the right thing in the text. Malachi is surprised by this. 
Malachi the prophet is surprised by this. It's like he's writing and saying, I, I know that Jacob is not the better character, but I just want you to know that God has chosen him because God is faithful. One commentator writes, God's gracious choice of Jacob and her descendants, Israel, as his covenant people rather than Esau's descendants, Edom, demonstrates his unfathomable love for Israel. I said it a few weeks ago, his reckless love. God's passing over Esau and his descendants for his honor, for, his, for this honor was almost like hate in comparison. See, this language is so strong to show God's enduring faithfulness to his people. And we learn that lesson here in Genesis chapter 33. We learn that Jacob is someone who simply is getting hold of God's faithfulness. Not that he's doing everything right, but he's becoming an object lesson for us to walk out of here today with. This idea of, are you getting hold of God's faithfulness? Are you letting it enter into your heart and your mind? Are you letting it overcome you? God is so faithful. And this is the picture we have. And I can't, I can't even fathom this. It's even hard to explain on a Sunday morning. Moreover, let's make another New Testament connection here because I like to do that in the text as we look at Old Testament references in the front and in the New Testament in the back. Could it be that the story of Jacob and Esau is even a model that Jesus deliberately chose to pattern his famous story of the lost prodigal son on? Don't believe me? It's all written in Luke 15. If you want to turn there, you can. You don't have to. I'll just read a chunk for me. It's the famous lost chapter where Jesus talks about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and finally the lost or the prodigal son. And if you remember this story at all, the prodigal son chapter, there was a man who had two sons. One, the older, was very obedient. He did everything he could to earn his father's favor. And he did well. He was the better character in the beginning of the story. The other son, the younger, asked for his share of the inheritance early and took it from his dad. And went out, spent the whole thing on terrible living, wandering his way home from home, both physically and symbolically. After he had spent all this life in shameful ways, he came home groveling to see if his father would accept him, even as the hired hand, so that he could get back on his feet again. And that's the story we have in Luke 15, verses 18 and following, where we see this. It says, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Do you know this was the same thing we heard with the Esau story? The loving father that Jesus describes in Luke 15 is described like this. But while he was still a long ways off, the father saw him, felt compassion, ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. Now listen to what happened with Jacob Esau. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. What an amazing connection. This is the hope of the gospel displayed in the lives of Jacob and Esau. Gospel re reconciliation and connects the chapters to us here. Like think about this. God is with Jacob, the younger son who goes to this far country, makes a complete mess of his life. Yet God is near to him all throughout that journey as well. Esau is the older son who seems to do just fine for himself. He actually marries against his parents' wishes in a way. Actually, it's a whole other story too, but has a fairly successful life not far from his family. And although he was favored by his father, he was always favored by his father. Jacob comes home and God shows up in his journey, meets with him and prays with him. He receives this great gift of God's presence with him as Jacob is going home again. And then we see reconciliation happen. I mean, these stories have parallels to them to remind us of the great faithfulness of God to his people. Is it possible that this entire story is a microcosm or a picture of the gospel? Jacob has shown the kindness of God through his brother, and we today get the benefit of that because we get to see it. We get to see what reconciliation looks like. We get to see what God's faithfulness to one who has wandered far looks like. Friends, here's some good news for you. If you've wandered far, if you feel like you're so far from the grace of God this morning that you showed up here because it was your last step, you're like, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm at the last rung on the ladder. Hear me here. God is faithful 
It's why you're here. You're here this morning to experience the good news, to hear about gospel reconciliation, how it can happen, not just in the lives of people, but in our relationship with God. That we get this story of the prodigal God in Luke 15 that surely echoes the story of Jacob and Esau back in Genesis to remind us what this really looks like. That Jacob thought he deserved death and indeed probably did deserve death. And yet here was Esau who forgave him and said, you are my family. I'm going to hug you. I'm going to kiss you. We're going to weep together because you are now home. That's what the gospel says to you this morning. If you need to hear that, you're home this morning. The father would run to you with arms open and say, come receive my grace. You can be reconciled to me through my son, Jesus Christ, who suffered on your behalf, who died for you and who gave his life for you so that you can have newness of life. See, for me, I I think of this story now and I think how much God displays his faithfulness from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end. The Bible tells us this is our story as well. You know, you'd think this would change Jacob's life forever. (laughs) Well, not quite. We get to the end of chapter 33, which is a little bit strange because there's all these places and weird things. Esau asks him to go somewhere and he says, I'm going to go here. And then he goes somewhere else. You're like, what's happening here? Well, if you know the details and if you don't know the details, let's just put it this way. Jacob lives up to his old name again of deceiving his brother, doing his own thing and decides to go into all these various places except where he originally said he was going to go. Even more uniquely, you know, you should know that God summoned Jacob back to a place called Bethel in Genesis chapter 28 that happened before this as attempt to get back to his household, to get back to his place, to get back to his land, go to Bethel is what the Lord said to him. So the question mark becomes, is Jacob back in Bethel? The answer is quite obviously no, as you're reading this. In fact, we're told that he told Esau he was going somewhere, ended up somewhere else, and he ended up first at Succoth, and then he purchased his property in Shechem. What's interesting is that following his escape from Laban, Jacob willfully spent a decade doing whatever he pleased, first dwelling for a time outside the promised land. And then when he finally did cross over into the promised land, he settled in prosperous Shechem instead of traveling 20 miles further to go to Bethel. Now, 20 miles is a long way in their day. Okay. It's not like hopping in the car and driving down to Renton or something like that. It's very different now. This is Jacob's attempt at saying, I'm still doing things my way. I'm still choosing to do the things that I want to do. In fact, I'm even laying a a pathway of destruction here, even in the end. What I find interesting is that Jacob at one point did make a vow to go to Bethel. Bruce Waltke argues that. He even says that although he purchased the land and erected an altar as acts of faith at the end of chapter 33, Jacob errs in settling into the land. He made a vow to worship in Bethel when he returned to the promised land, but it takes him 10 more years to actually get there. 10 more years he spends after this gospel reconciliation moment, after this moment that he thought he was going to die, it takes him 10 years to get to the point where he actually is obedient to the Lord. So he's halfway there, if you will. But let me ask you an honest question. Can you be halfway obedient? Ask any parent, right? (laughs) Can you be halfway obedient? I think no. Halfway obedience is actually disobedience. It's always a delusional image that we have in our mind that we can actually obey God when we're only halfway obeying him. And this is eternally true with dealing with God. We think, oh, if I just do part of what he's asked, then he's going to be fine with me and everything's okay. This doesn't negate his faithfulness that we've talked about over and over, but there's a sense here that we are called to something as well. And what's really interesting is that we can always justify partial obedience. We can always do it. I think even Jacob was doing that. I'm fine. I'm, I'm almost there. I almost made it back. I left the land that I was from. And yet I wonder if God's up there saying, but you, you made a vow to come back to Bethel. You come back here. You came back to this place. But what's amazing is that God is still incredibly faithful to Jacob more so than I can even imagine. Cause see, that's where we get to chapter 35. Would you flip with me there real quick? I'm going to read a few verses here and see what happens. Many years pass, 10 years, decade passes here. He's seen reconciliation happen. He's seen the great faithfulness of God. He's seen all of this stuff happen. And what happens next is mind blowing. Check this out. Genesis 35, verse one and following. God said to Jacob, arise, go to Bethel and dwell there. 10 years later, I mentioned that, right? Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, 
Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that he had had and that they had had and the rings that were in their ears. So Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them. So they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under the oak below Bethel. So he called the place Alan Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give you the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. (laughs) The greatest words I've ever heard are, God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel and dwell there. Ten years later. He already told him to do it. He was being disobedient for ten years. And yet, what was God? You should know the answer by now. Faithful. He was faithful. Ten years later. God is not done with Jacob. He lived for years in disobedience. The effect on Jacob is that maybe now he's willing to be obedient. Happily, chapter 35 records Jacob's turnaround, his newfound obedience, but it also chronicles sad residual failures as we get to the end of his life as well. But even in this, there is still hope because God is faithful, one who has seized God's faithfulness. Friends, let me give you a little bit of hope this morning. There's an idea in Christian living called sanctification. It means that when you become a Christian, God's working on you to transform you slowly, bit by bit, into the image of Christ. Let me just say this. Sanctification is slow. It's slow. And the amazing good news is that God is more patient than you and I are. And this is such good news to me. I think of my own life and I go, man, I've been struggling with the same sin for 10 years. Oh yeah, Jacob did too. And what did God do? Still showed up to him and told him, hey, let me just remind you, you know, you were supposed to do something 10 years ago. In God's time, his economy, his everything, I think of this story and I go, how in the world are you doing this? Because if I were God and I had creatures who were not doing what I said, my decision of what to do with them would be vastly different than what God's is. Like, oh, maybe I'll just start out with some new creatures, you know? I'll do something else. People who just obey me because they're not obeying me now. And yet we get this continual gonging symbol, clanging drum, whatever it is, clanging symbol, I don't know what you'd say, of God's faithfulness. But don't let this be confusing to us that God's not going to let us off the hook for our decisions either. Because that's sanctification. God is working in our lives by his faithfulness to draw us closer to him. And the crazy thing is it's his faithfulness that's supposed to draw us closer to help us choose not to sin, to stay away from the things that are broken and the choices that we make that actually destroy our lives. It's his kindness and it's his faithfulness that helps us not do those things. Not a sense of fear, not a sense of, oh my gosh, dad's going to be angry at me if I do this and he's going to punish me in some wicked, horrible way. It's a sense of being absolutely grateful for his faithfulness and his love, just like we saw gospel reconciliation in chapter 33, that he's willing to run like Jesus brought it up in Luke 15 to us when we've been wandering and do our own thing. But sometimes it takes us years to learn to do these things. Sometimes sanctification takes years in your life. Why are you still wrestling with the same sin that you've been wrestling with for years and years? I don't know. Why was Jacob? Why do we? I mean, I read this story and I go, come on, Jacob. I don't like you very much. Then I go, oh, I don't like myself either, actually. You know what I mean? I do this too. This is all, uh, this is the human experience. And we are good to accept the honest truth that God is faithful to us and that we can turn to him in worship.
Now, if you look at verses two and three in chapter 25, what's ama- chapter 35, it's amazing what happens because Jacob se- finally seems to sense the significance of God's calling on his life. Because Jacob's re- response to this call is obedience and this greater sense of responsibility for his household spiritual well-being. I mean, they had foreign gods in their houses. Like, it's just a little thing that maybe Moses threw in there for us. Like, were they living according to the way that God wanted? No. And so here is God once again in his absolute faithfulness to come to Jacob and say, change this. And so at this point, we see some movement towards the Lord. We see some things about them taking these things. I, I have a whole story of why he probably hid the gods and that doesn't fit in my sermon today. So unfortunately, we can't get there as well. But what's interesting is in verse six and seven, what the text does is we finally see them getting to Bethel. The whole family gathers and they worship the God of Bethel, which is funny. That's how the text says the God of Bethel. Jacob calls the place, the pillar El Bethel. And in Hebrew, that means uh, not just Bethel. It means the God of Bethel, the God of the God of Bethel basically is what that means. It's kind of this weird thing. Is this pantheism? What's Jacob doing here? No, he's reminding himself of what's going on here. He's reminding himself that God had called me here. This is the goal, the trajectory of my life and where I'm supposed to be heading. And God had called me to that. So he's finally recognizing God's plan and purposes. And then in an amazing moment, God speaks to him. And what does he do in this moment? He changes his name to Israel. Now, if you're an astute Bible reader, you're like, didn't that happen like two chapters ago? Yep, it did. It happened when he was wrestling with the, that man who turned out to be the, the pre-incarnate Christ. He's wrestling him and he asked him to bless him. And he says, your name is no longer. So what happened here? Why, didn't, why does he need to change his name twice? And let me just say this. It's because Jacob was still living like Jacob and not like Israel. He never made the change. He never actually got to the next step that God had called him to live. And we see this in these years. But Jacob, excuse me, God is faithful to Jacob. And he does this moment where he changes his name. Friends, how does this relate to us today? And this is what I'll close with. How does this relate to us? There is a name change that we can receive as well. That when we become Christians, God actually changes our names as well. It represents so much beautiful things, a change of life, a change of, of, uh, of identity, a change of all kinds of things. And here, and we see this story of God reminding Jacob of his new identity of Israel, we see something pretty amazing. I love that the Bible tells us one story of what God has done through Jesus Christ to rescue us from sin and death and ultimately restore his blessing to a renewed creation. And it's because of this reason that we see these amazing parts of our lives connecting with even Jacob's life. When we finally get a hold of the faithfulness of God, you will find that he gives us a new name as well. In fact, in Revelation 2, we have a picture of this. The Bible says, he who has an ear, an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes and conquers, I will give of hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Revelation 2.17. Whether or not this means that we are literally given a new name or not, I'm not sure. What I know for sure is that anyone who's in Christ has been given a new identity as well. First of all, you just bear the name of Christ. You're a Christian. You're one who has a new identity in that way, just like Jacob. And this new identity is to sanctify us. It's to help draw us nearer to God, to remind ourselves on a regular basis, to get hold of the faithfulness of God. And I like to think of it in terms of like, God is trying by our new identity to help our character, our identity, and our mission. This is what he's giving to us as people. And this is what he does to Jacob. And this is the most Amazing part of being Christian because in a new name, you're compelled to live out your character in the way that God would want you to live. Jacob moves from deceiver to struggles with God. He became Israel, even though he was pegged as a deceiver. And you're starting to see some hope in his life because God was committed to his character. Likewise, if you are a Christian in here today, God is committed to your character. He's committed to you working on it. That is you living out your new name. And it might take 10 years for you to get there. It's joining a club of all of us doing it together to trust in God's faithfulness to help us kill sin and walk with him each day. As I've heard it said, be killing sin or we'll be killing you. That's what I told you. One of the most painful things about my ministry is seeing people's sins destroy their lives. Be killing sin or it'll be killing you. This is part of our new identity that God is giving to us, our new character that God has given to us. The second thing is identity. 
The idea is that our identity now is in Christ. And if we are in Christ, we're born into a new family. We have God as our father. And there's so much hope and freedom in this idea as God, as our father. We go back to that idea of the prodigal son story, the story of gospel reconciliation, which can be yours too. And as I already mentioned to you, it's worth repeating that God in the form of the father in this story arose. And while his son was still a long ways off, felt compassion on him, ran and embraced him and kissed him and brought him back into the family, gave him a ring, gave him the place of honor back in the family again. That's part of our sanctification as well, that God wants to give us that new identity to bring you into the family. Friends, if you need help in your identity, would you read Ephesians chapter 1 later? Read Ephesians 1. It will tell you who you are in Christ. Not only is it the character that God is working on, it's the identity. And then finally, it's the mission. And this is a really cool part. We see Jacob's life in the final end is that he's changed to Israel. What's crazy is his name's going to go back and forth between Jacob and Israel several times in the rest of the text, all the way till the end of the Bible, which tells you a little bit about Jacob and Israel and his choices and things like that. But what's crazy is when God appears to him and changes his name, he restates the promises of Genesis 128 to make him fruitful, to multiply him, to do all these things to him, to bless him, to be a blessing. And that is his calling as Israel, as a new person, as a new identity, as a new character, as a new mission. His calling is to be a blessing to other people. And that's your calling too, if you're a Christian in here. See, you can't just hear this news and do nothing with it. You have to take it to someone else and share this great news with them. And you can say, hey, I was like Jacob too. 10 years running from the Lord, doing whatever I wanted to do, trying to take steps forward and finding myself falling back. And yet God was faithful because the reality is the giants of the faith are what? Those who actually have gotten hold of God's faithfulness. That's for you and for me this morning. That's what God wants to do in us as a church community. And I believe that we're going to respond to the Lord this morning. And as we do, we get a chance to sing some songs. We get a chance to worship together, to reflect on these words, to reflect on your own life. Maybe you get a chance this morning to just ponder, marinate on these things that God wants to give you this new identity and help you in your character and send you on mission. He's, he's calling you back home again. Where, where are you at this morning? I don't know, but I bet you God's speaking to you by his spirit. And may he do that this morning for you. And as we sing, you can come forward and receive communion on the tables. Uh, there's gluten-free bread in both our baskets over here. You can take that bread and dip that in the cup and receive that by faith. And then you can also give. There's giving baskets in the front. You can come forward anytime and give as an act of worship. If you're new to Imprint, we don't pass baskets or anything. We come forward and give as an act of worship. And you're welcome to do that. And then finally, you're welcome to pray as well. There'd be people who would be willing to pray for you here who have prayer tags on. If you need prayer for anything today, um, maybe the sermon was a miss and you just came here because you need someone to pray, pray with you. That's wonderful. Please take advantage of that. Pray with someone. You can kind of go back in that corner back there and someone would be willing to pray for you and spend some time with you. And I would encourage you to do that if you need prayer for anything today. But your job now is to respond. Your job right now is to take the message, to take the things the Lord has said and allow him to draw your heart to him so you might experience his faithfulness in your life. Let's pray about these things. Lord, thank you so much for your word. We covered a lot today, and uh, I, I know it's one of those things, Lord, where sometimes we come into church with expectations or thoughts or ideas about who God is or um, how he looks at us or whatever it is. And yet today, I pray, Lord, that somehow I, maybe I, I built a bridge between who you are and who you want us to be. So Lord, I, I pray for every single one of us in here this morning. I pray that as we think about the songs we're going to sing, as we receive communion together, um, if we believe in you and come forward and receive the body of Christ broken for us and the blood spilled for the new covenant, Lord, I pray that we would experience your grace and mercy anew this morning. Lord, touch our hearts, touch our minds. Help us to see your unending faithfulness to us. Lord, help us to be people who get hold of your faithfulness. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.